Good evening, or good morning, as the case may be. I'm Monica Cronin, the curator of the Geoffrey Kay Museum of Anaesthetic History, which is part of the Australian and New Zealand College of Anaesthetists. Welcome to our April History of Medicine Talks. I'm talking to you today from the stolen lands of the Woiwurrung Wurundjeri people. The museum stands across the river of the Wurrung on the traditional estate of the Yalakut Willem clan of the Bunrung language group, lands and sovereignty never ceded. I pay respect to the elders, past and present, and extend that to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples from the many nations of this land known as Australia. I also acknowledge and pay respect to the Na'ili Māori of the Tangata Whenua of Aotearoa and commit to upholding the principles of Te Tira o Watangi. Tonight we're joined by Paul and Tyson from Auslan Connections who will be providing Auslan interpretation. We're also joined by my colleague Cass who will be helping me monitor the chat function to make sure your questions reach our speaker. So feel free to drop any questions as we go along and we'll gather them for our Q&A session at the end. Before we get started, I'd also like to remind everyone we'll be speaking with Wendy Moore on Thursday night. Wendy is the author of Endale Street, a wonderful book outlining the contributions of medical women through the establishment of a military hospital staffed entirely by women during World War I. Next Monday, I'll be joined by curators Kat Clark and Paris Norton as they discuss the development of the Jeffrey K Museum's latest exhibition, Jimbana Whake Ora, First Nations Medicine, Health and Healing. And I hope you can join us for those sessions as well. But tonight we're gonna to hear from Rebecca Lush, the curator of the Integrated Pathology Learning Centre at the University of Queensland. She has an impressive record of involvement with the history of the museum. And at UQ, Rebecca manages the pathology collection, supports pathology teaching, organises exhibitions and tours, and participates in community outreach. Rebecca is also interested in the darker side of medical history and in challenging many of the overarching narratives. Tonight, she's gonna to take us on one of those dark journeys into a world of serial killers who use chloroform for their own purposes. When chloroform first hit the medical scene as an effective anesthetic agent, it was rightly hailed as a medical triumph but it wasn't long before its use became, shall we say, controversial. It was quite quickly found to be responsible for a number of anesthesia-related deaths and its use was largely scaled back. Tonight, Rebecca Lush is going to take us through the stories of notorious serial killers, including H.H. H. Holmes, Frederick Moores and Thomas Neil Cream, and add, a, add another layer to the complex history of chloroform. So, over to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. So I too want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm presenting my talk tonight, the Tarabal and Yagara peoples. I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and future. Thank you to Monica Cronin from the Jeffrey K Museum of Anesthetic History for inviting me to speak this evening as part of the 2021 History of Medicine series. I'm really looking forward to hearing the other presenters that you have lined up for the series. I'd also like to begin today with a disclaimer. It should come as no surprise considering the title of my presentation, but it is worth mentioning that the following discussion will include the topics of death, murder, suicide and abortion. In my PowerPoint, there will be no graphic imagery accompanying the case studies. Finally, before we delve in, this paper also presents a certain historical perspective, drawing exclusively from a Western history of anesthesia with case studies from North America and the United Kingdom. So I've been fascinating in researching anesthetic history since about 2016 when I undertook an internship at the Jeffrey K Museum. That truly sparked my interest in learning about the history of this particular field of medicine. Through my research, I began to notice what you might call a developing trend. 
almost all research on anesthetic history I came across was championing a narrative of progression and one of celebration. More specifically, a narrative guided by men that celebrated the achievements of men. I do want to disclose that this paper will not be discouraging the views that anesthetic agents, such as chloroform, significantly advance the potential of medicine, in particular surgery. There is no denying that the introduction of anesthesia allowed for the development of invasive life-saving surgeries and introduced the possibility of a painless procedure. Instead, this paper will be applying a new approach to the history of anesthesia and observing its more sinister past to try and add layers and more complexity to the narrative. The foundations for this have already been laid by Linda Strutman in her book, Chloroform, The Quest for Oblivion, published in 2003. Strutman introduces the perspective that chloroform, while very beneficial, has been misused and abused throughout history. In her chapter titled Murder, Mishap and Melancholy, there is a discussion on accidental deaths, suicides and murder. There is a particular focus on chloroform being taken recreationally, leading to accidental deaths, and the inexperience of certain doctors performing surgeries with chloroform, leading to patient deaths. Alongside this, there has been a rise in public intrigue with true crime. As I'm sure a few of you listening tonight have spent extended periods of time on Netflix, I don't have to tell you that a new true crime documentary is released almost weekly. This in part has been spurred by the emergence of podcasts such as My Favourite Murder that took this once almost forbidden topic reserved from inside the walls of the coroners and police departments into the wider discourse. Returning back to chloroform in particular, in 2018, there was an article published by Arts and Entertainment Television in America, which described how chloroform has been used in murder cases over the past 25 years. It is within this context that you're able to research and disseminate information that both informs and intrigues. For example, it is becoming increasingly possible to give presentations such as this. In 2019, I came across a bit of source material on serial killers and chloroform. And since then, there has been so much more released by both individuals and institutions. It is also from within this wider context that I'm presenting my talk this evening. I will be adding to the conversation by digging deeper into the use of chloroform by three serial killers, Dr. Thomas Neil Cream, H.H. H. Holmes, and Frederick Moores. These three case studies can reveal quite a divergent attitude towards the anesthetic agent and its broader use. Most importantly, they can also reveal more about the historical and social context when chloroform became more commonly used. So I wanna take a moment just to ensure that everyone is aware of this wider narrative. This is the one that I alluded to earlier that I was discovering throughout my research. What will follow is just a very brief overview that's intended to bring everyone up to speed on some of the main narrative points that will include both chloroform and ether. So in 1831, Dr. Samuel Guthrie, photographed here, was attempting to create a pesticide by combining whiskey and chlorinated lime. This concoction would become the basis of chloroform. On October 16, 1846, William T.G. Morton publicly demonstrated the use of ether as a form of anesthesia. Dr. Morton performed this surgery at what is now termed the ether dome in Massachusetts General Hospital. One year later, in 1847, Scottish physician Sir James Young Simpson first used chloroform during surgery by dripping the substance onto a sponge that was then inhaled by the patient. Working with chloroform was dangerous. Too little and the patient remained conscious during surgery. Too much 
led to respiratory paralysis and inevitably death. Alongside such events was Dr. John Snow, who experimented with both chloroform and ether, working to discover how they could be used more effectively. Snow was a significant figure in early public health. You may know his name from his work on cholera, and that was celebrated as a major contribution to the understanding of health in the 19th century. By mapping the spread of cholera, Snow was able to isolate the disease and determine it was the result of contaminated water. Snow is also famously remembered as administering chloroform to Queen Victoria during the births of her eighth and ninth children. Okay, so that's the end of the overview. And there should be two main things that stand out from what I just read. Firstly, it's all positive, highlighting great experimentation and the development of different agents in the hopes that there might one day be an option for a painless surgery. Secondly, you may have noticed, and you probably can see on the screen, that every name I said was male. In addition to being about medical progress, stories of anesthetic history almost always follow the great man theory methodology. Popular in the 19th century, this approach suggests that the past can be largely explained by great men or heroes who in some way impacted on the course of history. Over time, it's been re-evaluated and deemed too sim simplistic in understanding the past. Although I will be talking about central individuals in my paper, that is the serial killers, I hope to achieve two primary goals. Firstly, establish more of a social and cultural context around the introduction and growing use of chloroform, not just for the purposes of surgery. Secondly, I hope to expose and reevaluate the chloroform narrative, adding new elements to what has been communicated overwhelmingly as one of progress and triumph. I also want to ensure that the victims of these crimes are named where possible and have their stories heard. As far back as 1850, there were questions surrounding chloroform's misuse by members of the general public. During that year, Dr. John Snow published an article in the London Medical Gazette stating that chloroform had been used in a series of crimes, however, to no success. Only two crimes to his knowledge had involved chloroform. However, and I quote, insensibility was not induced and the perpetrators were arrested. We know a bit about these two crimes. So one was an attack on a clergyman in a temperance hotel in Kendall. A robber waited until the clergyman was asleep, then attacked with a chloroform soaked towel. Due to the loud outburst and struggle, others in the hotel were very quickly alerted and the police arrested the attacker. The second case involved two young sweethearts, as they were termed by the newspaper, who were returning home from a dance. On their way home, the man poured chloroform on a handkerchief, which he then held up to the woman's face. She managed to break away and screamed alerting a police officer patrolling the streets to respond. Apart from these two crimes, there was a general belief held that since chloroform was cheap and easy to make, it could fall into the wrong hands and become quite a common feature in other crimes. The Lancet, which is a popular medical journal, noticed this increasing concern and published an article trying to make light of the fact considering it would take approximately five minutes of inhalation to knock someone unconscious. So during those five minutes, you could fight back and there was a chance that it would have no effect. So we know that chloroform was used in surgeries from the 1850s. From my research, I was not able to find evidence to suggest it was used successfully for murder during the 1850s or the 1860s. First reports of a link between chloroform and murder were made in the 1870s with Dr. Cream 
who I will talk about shortly. There is still very much a possibility that chloroform was used in murders prior to this time. And as more is unveiled and more source material comes to light, perhaps the dark history of anesthesia and murder can be traced back even further. So the first case study that I will be discussing this evening is that of Dr. Thomas Neil Cream, who is also known as the Lambeth Poisoner. Cream was a Scottish, Canadian, American serial killer, who some credit as the first serial killer who was also a practicing doctor. So Cream was born in Glasgow, but studied at McGill University in Montreal. He graduated in 1876, and during his final year, he wrote a thesis on the effects of chloroform. Needless to say, he became very familiar with this drug and especially its effect on the human body. After completing his postgraduate studies in Edinburgh, Cream moved to Ontario and began practicing as a fully qualified medical doctor. There is limited information out there on Cream during the first three years of his work. However, in 1879, the body of Kate Gardner was found in an alleyway behind his practice. It was discovered that the cause of death was poisoning by chloroform. And it is alleged that Gardner had an affair with cream and she was discovered to be pregnant during autopsy. Before any investigations could occur, cream fled to America. He argued that her pregnancy was the result of an affair with a local businessman and not with him. Although there was speculation at the time that Gardner may have committed suicide, death by chloroform more often than not meant murder, as one could not hold a soaked sponge or towel over their nose and mouth for the full five minute duration it would need to work and not instinctively pull away. The case was dropped due to cream fleeing the country, preventing any further investigation. While Cream was in America, he settled in Chicago and he was convicted by the Chicago police of murdering the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad station master, Daniel Stott. He was imprisoned for the term of his natural life. This is the only murder that police charged Cream with while in Chicago. During his time working in the city, Cream performed abortions on sex workers, many of whom were later discovered dead. His practice was established not too far from the red light district, and it is well known that Cream would perform illegal abortions for a limited cost. However, Cream was only convicted for the murder of the station master. 10 years after his imprisonment, he was released after being declared a fit and proper subject for executive clemency. Between his release in July 1891 and July 1892, Cream returned to England, settling in London at 103 Lambeth Palace Road. During this time, he murdered four sex workers, attempted to murder a fifth, and sent extortion letters to well-known and respected doctors in the area. These letters actually accused them of committing the crime. His first victim was Ellen Nellie Donworth, a 19-year-old sex worker who had a drink with cream only to wake up severely ill and later died. Cause of death was strychnine poisoning. A few days later, cream murdered his second victim, Matilda Clover, and blamed her death on physician Dr. William Broadbent, accusing him of committing the crime. Alice Marsh and Emma Shrivel were his final two victims who died in agony after being administered a small amount of chloroform. The attempted murder was of Louise Harvey in London. She was suspicious of cream and pretended to swallow the pills that he had given her, but she later disposed them in the River Thames. Due to their suspicions, police shortly investigated into Cream's past, dubbing him the Lambeth Poisoner 
and he was hanged for his crimes in November 1892. According to myth and legend, Cream declared himself, I am Jack the, before being silenced. Now it's not possible that Cream was Jack the Ripper considering those crimes took place while Cream was in jail in Chicago. As well as chloroform, evidence from autopsies indicated that Cream, as I mentioned earlier, utilized strychnine to poison his victims. One year after Cream was hanged for his crimes, another serial killer who utilized chloroform would appear in Chicago. Rather than attracting victims through the promise of carrying out medical procedures, this killer would use their position as somewhat of a hotelier in the midst of one of America's largest public events. In 1861, Herman Webster Mudgett was born in New Hampshire. Very little historical record exists on his early life. There are some sources that suggest Mudgett murdered his cousin while ice skating one winter. This claim cannot really be supported by any evidence. So for this reason, many historians and biographers jump straight from his birth to 1882, when he enrolled at the University of Michigan Medical School. Mudgett was eventually expelled from this school after it was discovered he was stealing cadavers and using them to collect on fraudulent insurance policies. Mudgett would take out life insurance policies on the already deceased, then forge death certificates, ensuring that he could collect large sums of money. On leaving university, Mudgett moved to Chicago and changed his name to Henry Howard Holmes or H.H. H. Holmes. It is believed he changed his name to Holmes after being inspired by the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Although he was expelled, Mudgett uh, Holmes created and lived under the illusion that he was a legitimate medical doctor. After working briefly as a pharmacist in Englewood, Chicago, Holmes soon purchased the land opposite the pharmacy and started construction on a three-storey building containing shops on the ground level and long-stay apartments on the levels above. It was known locally as the castle. During construction, multiple builders were employed and fired with no one individual or company ever seeing the entire blueprint. Holmes did befriend one particular carpenter, Benjamin Peitzel, who would later become his partner in crime, so to speak. The original blueprints of the castle have not survived. Descriptions that can be found in newspapers may have been exaggerated and sensationalized for the sake of a good story. Reports included that the hotel contained hallways that led to nowhere, trap doors to the basement and sliding doors. There was also soundproof rooms, acid vats, picks of quicklime and a crematorium in the basement. In an article from the Chicago Tribune, a map is included with room names such as Room of the Three Corpses and Mysterious Closed Room All Bricked In. Construction finished just in time for the World's Columbian Exposition, which was held in Chicago in 1893. Why this is particularly important to note is not only because there were millions of guests descending on Chicago needing accommodation, but some of these guests were single young women who were traveling from faraway locations to visit the fair. They were coming to Chicago to gain employment and live an independent life, free from their often conservative and restrictive families. Letters from women to their families during this time can confirm such speculations as they would often write of their newfound freedom in the big city of Chicago. The World's Exposition was one of the largest held during this time period and completely transformed the social, cultural and physical fabric of Chicago. Unlike previous fairs, this one ran for six months and saw just over 27 million visitors. It was heralded a huge success and inspired many individuals, including Walt Disney, who would model his famous amusement park after the stories his father told 
about working at the fair. If you're looking for more information on this fascinating event, then I highly recommend The Devil in the White City. Everything from the unveiling of the world's first Ferris wheel to the incredibly stressful story of project management up to the last second and beyond is covered. So we'll be returning to the castle now. And not every guest who stayed at the castle fell victim to homes. In fact, many individuals stayed for weeks to see the fair and return safely home. Holmes would confess to murdering in total 23 guests. Nine were confirmed by police on further investigation. Police also presented the possibility that there could have been up to 200 victims. Why it's so difficult to pinpoint is due to the fact that Holmes was a compulsive liar. And there was evidence to suggest that he would turn his victims into skeletons and sell these to medical schools across the country. After the end of the World Exposition, Holmes travelled around the country, continuing to carry out insurance scans, and he was eventually arrested. The police would later find his castle and he was hanged for his crimes. It's difficult to say definitively what police found when they entered the castle, with some reports claiming in the basement was a blood-soaked operating table with an array of medical tools and disintegrating acids nearby. It was also claimed that there were chutes that dropped from upper levels directly into the basement. It's very important to note here, as I mentioned before, that a lot of information you can find on HH Homes needs to be read through a sensationalised lens. What we do know, and there is no doubt, Holmes was a serial killer, and he seemed to target people that he knew. As to the extent of his depravity and crimes, this may remain unanswered. Before I discuss the two murders where chloroform was used, I want to briefly mention his other victims that to the best of our knowledge can be confirmed. In April 1896, one month prior to his execution, Holmes released a full confession that can be found and read online. As you can see in this image on the screen, there are 10 victims named. Benjamin Peitzel and Julia Connor, I will discuss later. Pearl Connor was the daughter of Julia Connor and it is believed her bones were found in the basement of the castle. She was reported missing along with her mother in 1891. The three Peitzel children, Alice, Nellie and Howard, have been confirmed as their bodies were found in a cottage owned by Holmes in 1895. Emmeline Sigrand worked as Holmes's private secretary, lured to the castle by the promise of an increased salary. She was engaged to Holmes, however, soon disappeared, never to be heard from again. Minnie and Nanny Williams were sisters, with Minnie having married Holmes in 1893. Newspapers reported <clears throat> that police found Minnie's watch chain and Nanny's garter buckle in one of the basement's ovens. Finally, Edna von Tassel worked in the castle and similar to the others I've just mentioned, she disappeared without a trace. There are two accounts of the use of chloroform by Holmes during the fair. The first was on victim Julia Connor, who was married to a worker at the pharmacy. Holmes began an affair with Connor soon after he started working there that led to her husband, Ned, fleeing Chicago to never return. When Holmes discovered that Connor was pregnant, she agreed to let him perform an abortion. So remember that Holmes was impersonating a doctor and convincing many that he could perform surgeries and carry out pharmaceutical work when in fact he couldn't. During the procedure, Holmes overdosed Connor with chloroform, leading to her death. As with many accounts from families of the victims, Holmes would convince guests of his castle and the families that the individual they once knew or saw walking the hallways had just suddenly departed 
went to work or live in another area of America. The second confirmed case of Holmes's use of chloroform was on his business and crime partner, Benjamin Peitzel. When Holmes was traveling around America post exposition, he set up an office with Peitzel in Philadelphia with the intention of carrying out more insurance scans. In 1894, the office was burned down and the body of Peitzel found amongst the rubble. As Holmes had a life insurance policy on Peitzel, he received a large sum of money. So this made police suspicious and the insurance scam was uncovered. So the body of Peitzel was exhumed for a second autopsy. This time they discovered that Peitzel had in fact been murdered by chloroform and the fire was just a cover. Holmes confessed to the murder of Peitzel by chloroform and to the additional 23 murders in the castle declaring to police officers, I was born with the devil in me. In 1895, the castle was completely gutted by fire with reports from the New York Times revealing two men entered the building around 8 p.m. and half an hour later, there were several explosions and a fire. The exterior of the building survived, but was torn down in 1938. Today, the Englewood Post Office now stands on the site of the castle. On a tour back in 2019, I visited the site and was told that if you offer coffee and donuts to the postal workers, they can take you into the basement of the building where two doors and two rooms from the original castle survive. My final case study will be on Frederick Moores. Born Carl Menerick, Moores was responsible for the death of eight nursing home patients in New York City between 1914 and 1915. After immigrating to New York from Austria-Hungary in June 1914, Moores started working at the Odd Fellows home in Unionport, New York, now the Bronx. He was fascinated with medical procedures often would spend his spare time visiting hospitals and asking surgeons if he could watch them perform surgery. In late 1914, New York coroner James P. Dunn launched an investigation into the Oddfellows home as quite a few residents were dying from claimed natural causes. By the time the investigation had formally started, eight patients had died. Dunn managed to uncover a few peculiarities, including the physicians who had signed the death certificates had never actually seen the patients. The cause of death was first recorded as arsenic poisoning and the superintendent of the home, Adam Banger, was jailed. When interviewing potential witnesses, it was soon discovered that the cause of the death for the majority of patients was actually chloroform that had been applied to a towel and held over the face of the victims. It was then that attention turned to Moores, who quickly confessed to the killings, revealing he had switched from arsenic to chloroform because it was easier to obtain. While the investigation progressed, Moores enjoyed reenacting the murders for medical doctors who were there to assess his mental state. The local media at the time use this particular series of murders to shed light on the abuse and neglect that was occurring in the Oddfellows home and more broadly in nursing homes around New York. Moores was admitted into the Hudson State River Hospital in New York, only to escape a year later in May, 1916. Moores adopted a new alias, Frederick Benno, as you can see in the image here, and he began work in the first aid department of Turner and Seymour Company. He disappeared in 1918, and five years later, a corpse was discovered that police believed to be the remains of Moore. They could identify the body by the shoes, Moore's favorite to wear, and found two bottles of poison nearby, leading to the belief that he had committed suicide. The victims were Carl Hitzel, Henry Hansel, Carl Garth, Catherine Piazza, Frederick Dre, Elizabeth Hauser, Henry Horn, and Ferdinand Schultz. The final five names I read were killed by chloroform. Although rare, there do continue to be crimes committed 
<clears throat> with the existence of chloroform. In 2011, Casey Anthony was on trial for the murder of her two-year-old daughter, Kaylee, with chloroform. More recently in 2014, David Cooper murdered Samina Imam with a chloroform soaked towel after discovering her affair with his brother. These studies, as with the three case studies I've presented, have seen the use of chloroform with malicious intent. They add to the potential hundreds of victims who were accidentally provided with the wrong dosage, had adverse reactions to the drug, or suffered from respiratory conditions for the rest of their lives. Many were the results of accidents and errors, particularly isolated to the 1800s. So in conclusion, the three case studies presented reveal that alongside this narrative of progress with chloroform, there's this narrative of its misuse, abuse, dangers and negative impacts on individuals and society. These narratives should not be regarded <clears throat> as two disparate paths, but rather should be combined, not only to highlight complexities, but to allow for a significantly deeper understanding of medical history and the effects of developments, actions and understandings on broader historical and social contexts. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions that aren't answered this evening, my email address is on the slide. Uh, also my Twitter handle, and I do run a blog as well where I review uh, museum and heritage places. So thank you.